My brother once told me something profound that I would have wanted to quote here in the opening of this video. But when I asked him to say it again so I could write it down, he had forgotten it. In paraphrasing, it had something to do with sometimes being able to come up with something ridiculous that the idea can live on as long as it can then... Anyway, whatever that quote was about, my brother said that in reference to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which as an IP has existed long enough that more than one generation has grown up with it, and so has come to write fanfiction about it. One of those people is James Tinian IV, who in 2015, when working for DC Comics, managed to talk them into doing an intercompany crossover with IDW Publishing for not one, not two, not three... Well, actually, yes, three comic book miniseries of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to team up with Batman. There was also a fourth one based on the Batman the Animated Series and the 2012 TMNT CGI cartoon, but that does not matter as much as the first comic book series that were the obvious inspirations to the 2019 animated adaptation that for some reason had VS in the title. I myself am not exactly a big TMNT fan, but I am respectful enough to the IP to know what it is about. Four human-sized turtles named after Renaissance artists, and who are taught martial arts by a rat who sees himself as their father. And they fight against a rival ninja clan led by a bad guy who named himself after an office appliance. So naturally, a ridiculously explainable concept like that goes hand in hand with Batman, when they are both taken as seriously without taking the ridiculousness too far. And I think you can guess what the target demographics usually are when popular comics like this are adapted into an audiovisual medium. I have read enough of the IDW's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics, where the Turtles and Master Splinter were reincarnations of Hamato Yoshi and his sons who were killed by Oroku Saki, to know that this is an out-of-canon story to that series. Just like how the only connection the crossover has to the Batman comics published at the time, are the two costumes that Batman was wearing in the comics at the same time. AKA the new 52 Batsuit and the DC Rebirth Batsuit. And for some dumbass reason, Batman in the 2019 VS in the name only movie ended up wearing a costume inspired by Neil Adams in the 1970s that looks less threatening than when the same design was used in Batman the Animated Series and the 2004 The Batman cartoon. But for some reason, Robin and Batgirl were given their modern costumes instead. Okay, that should be long enough opening, let's start going over the source material before moving on to comparing it to the animated adaptation. This is where I watched my parents die, Raphael. Issue number one. The first issue of the first series begins with Batman being given an eyewitness statement from an incident where the Foot Clan attacked slash appeared at Powers Industrial R&D Lab and stole a generator before the Turtles appeared to fight them. After Batman has promised the eyewitness he will find the stolen generator, we transition to a pizza being delivered near a sewer hole where the Turtles pay and receive it like they did in the 1990 movie. However, while they were getting the pizza, Killer Croc and his crew stumbled upon their safe house in Gotham sewers, which then leads to a fight sequence when Croc begins to trash their place, and the Turtles have to defend their home away from home. What are they? We're aliens, brah! Spooky aliens! We're not aliens, though. We're turtles. No. While they fight Croc's people, Michelangelo and Donatello initiate some combat dialogue in establishing that this is a parallel universe story where the Turtles and the Foot Clan have crossed over into Batman's world somehow. While that has been happening, Batman has been investigating the attack on Powers Industrial enough to recognize the attacks were done using some form of ninjutsu, but cannot comprehend the descriptions of the Turtles. Batman quickly dismisses the League of Assassins as potential suspects due to their specialized fighting discipline, and because Ra's al Ghul has not made a move against him yet. So far, the only lead he has is the stolen technology, which he has similar models developed at Wayne Enterprises, which so leads Batman to stake out his own company 
where the Foot Clan is already attacking. Batman deals with the Foot Clan ninjas and begins to interrogate them for what they were trying to steal, and questioning them about the turtles. Where are your meta humans? Meta? You mean the turtles? But the ninja is killed with a shuriken by Shredder, who warns Batman to stay away from the Foot's way or else. By this point, the Turtles have managed to defeat Killer Croc's crew at the cost of their safe house, and need to move elsewhere as pointed out by Raphael and Master Splinter. And of course, when climbing out the sewers, they come across the parked Batmobile that only Donatello sees as beautiful. It's... beautiful. Um, wild guess here, this might be his car. And Michelangelo warns him that Batman doesn't look happy with them gathered around his car. Issue number two. Everybody run! There's a crazy guy in a bat suit who's trying to kill us! Oh, oh, it's a talking yeah. toad! No! I know, right? Yeah. Spooky stuff! Oh, oh crud. The second issue opens with the turtles taking a stance against Batman, who looks to have an amused come at me bro attitude on the situation. Unlike in the 1990s movie against Shredder, the turtles attack Batman all at once, but Batman is able to dodge and counter their attacks back at them, and take them out one by one by taking their weapons and using them against them. Raphael, Michelangelo and Donatello are dealt quickly, with the fight against Leonardo lasting long enough for Batman to ask the right questions about their part in the robberies, until Master Splinter jumps in between them to hold Batman back while his sons retreat. The Turtles retreat to a closed old-school arcade, where their opinions on their encounter with Batman is shared with Raphael not liking him, Michelangelo fanboying over him, Donatello having a neutral opinion, and Leonardo having a much more strategic point of view in comparing their fight against Batman to more like how he was testing them. Raphael takes offense on Leonardo's point of view in having expected him and Master Splinter to have backed his hostile opinion on Batman. And speaking of Master Splinter, he has followed Batman to Wayne Enterprises, where he is meeting with Lucius Fox as Bruce Wayne. Lucius confirms to Bruce that the Turtles and the Foot Clan are from a parallel universe based on the tests done to the Psy Batman took from Raphael during the fight, which according to Lucius is transmuting into the metal native to their universe. And another thing Lucius shares with Bruce is that the blood from the Turtles has abnormal strain of mutagen, aka ooze, that is becoming inert as it does not exist in their universe. And another long story short, there was a scientist specialized in hypothetical qualities of transdimensional objects, who vanished a few weeks ago, and the stolen tech was based on this scientist's proposed models of the resonance engine, which should be able to make the travel between the two worlds possible. After thanking Lucius, Bruce goes out as Batman to investigate a black market connection bringing more of that technology to Gotham, and Master Splinter is shown looking into the data that Lucius left. That black market Batman went to investigate is then revealed to be handled by the Penguin, whom Shredder has used to get his hands on the resonance engine, with the Foot Clan then slaughtering Penguin's men to avoid paying him for it. Shredder would have killed Penguin as well, but Penguin is able to talk himself from being assassinated by recognizing Shredder's intentions to take over Gotham's criminal underworld, and providing his expertise in running it. The second issue ends with Master Splinter having shared what he overheard Lucius tell Bruce to his sons. That without the ooze mutagen existing in this world, they would revert back into a normal rat and normal turtles if they cannot return back to their home world. For this, they need help, and so Master Splinter has managed to lead them through a cave system to make their way to the Bat Cave. Issue number three. The third issue opens with a quick preview to two hours ahead of how Batman and the Turtles are attacking Shredder and the Foot Clan at the Penguin's Iceberg Lounge, before then going back to how Bruce and Alfred got the alert that someone is down in the Bat Cave. I've never been so happy in my entire life! Michelangelo is fanboying over Batcave's trophies, and Donatello is fanboying over the Bat computer, despite Master Splinter telling them to be more respectful to whom they have come to ask for help. 
so of course Batman lets them know he is there when Raphael is sharing his negative opinion on him to Leonardo. And another fight is however prevented when Master Splinter calls Batman by his real name and uses his elderly wisdom to implore everyone to share what they know of their current predicament. After quickly introducing themselves, explaining their relationship with the Foot Clan, and recapping what has been happening over the course of the previous two issues, Master Splinter reveals that they and the Foot Clan were sent from their world into this one by Krang, a third-party enemy of both them and the Foot Clan. They know Shredder has captured the missing scientist who could open the way between the two universes, but in doing so could end up stranding the Turtles and Master Splinter here, where the absence of the ooze mutagen could revert them back into base animals. To avoid this, they need Batman's help, who agrees to give it to them in telling Alfred who arrived late to stand down with his shotgun, and telling the Turtles they might be able to get back home, because he knows where Shredder and the Foot Clan have taken the resonance engine. This leads us back to the Iceberg Lounge, where Batman and the Turtles overpower the Foot Clan ninjas, rescue the missing scientist, and corner Shredder, who refuses to accept defeat, and instead destroys the resonance engine to keep the Turtles from being able to return to their world. Alfred also reports that the scientist they rescued, aka the only person who could rebuild it, has been killed with a subdermal bomb. Shredder escapes after fatally wounding Raphael, making Batman and the other Turtles unable to follow without getting him medical attention. And the issue's cliffhanger, Shredder learns that his getaway helicopter has been commandeered by Ra's al Ghul, who proposes an alliance between the Foot Clan and the League of Assassins. Issue number 4 the fourth issue opens in revealing that the captured Foot Clan ninjas have been sent to Arkham for denying their individualism, which the Joker sees as a prelude to something fun. At the Wayne Manor, Alfred pays for a stack of pizzas ordered for the Turtles, who have been given a refuge there. I offer to cook a gourmet meal, but they want pizza. Teenagers. In the Batcave, Master Splinter supervises combat training between Batman and Leonardo, while commenting the techniques of them both, which causes Leonardo to overpower Batman when he realizes that Master Splinter has recognized a flaw in his technique. Donatello reveals that he has been communicating with Cyborg at the Justice League for ways to get them back home, and how to slow down the ooze mutagen from becoming inert. They have not heard from Shredder either, and that is when Alfred and Michelangelo arrive with the pizzas that they also offer to Batman. Unfortunately, this rather positive bonding moment is broken by Raphael's emotional outburst, exclaiming how they have been figuratively just sitting on their asses doing nothing, and waiting to become normal animals to be put into a cage among the other trophies in the Batgame. Raphael's negative opinion on Batman has by this point grown to the point where knowing that he is Bruce Wayne to inaccurately see him as a thrill seeker who does what he does for fun, and their failure to secure the resonance engine is also on Batman from Raph's point of view. And so Raphael leaves the Batcave in deciding to work on getting back home alone. Elsewhere, Ra's al Ghul has helped Shredder and the Foot Clan to build a new way to cross dimensions, and Shredder has managed to receive a message from home that more weapons will be sent to him to kill the turtles and burn Gotham to the ground. Except that, when the machine that Ra's al Ghul's scientists have managed to build is turned on, it is Casey Jones who comes through, armed with sports equipment and declaring to be there to save his friends. On the road back to Gotham, Batman catches up with Raphael and asks him to come into the Batmobile for a chance to change his opinion on him. Because it's raining, Raphael gets into the car, and meanwhile in the Batcave, the Batcomputer gets an alarm for transdimensional energy signal, likely on Gage's arrival, leading to Michelangelo, Donatello and Leonardo to take another Batmobile to go look it up. Batman takes Raphael to Crime Alley on Park Row, and in a way to get Raph to understand him better, Batman shares his origin story of how his parents died there. It works, and Raphael understands Batman's drive, motivation and his commitment to help Raph, his brothers and Master Splinter in getting back to their home. 
And then Alfred calls Batman to tell that the other turtles took one of the Batmobiles to look up the energy signal, leading to Batman and Raphael to follow them. The fourth issue ends with Leonardo, Michelangelo and Donatello finding the barely alive Casey, who tells them that Shredder and Raj Al Ghul took the ooze mutagen he had brought with him to buy the turtles more time. Five canisters of the ooze mutagen, and they have taken them to Arkham Asylum. Issue number 5. The fifth issue opens with Batman, Leonardo and Raphael meeting Commissioner Gordon on the roof of the GCPD building by the Bat Signal. Uh, just think about your retirement. Some place where the turtles don't talk. After Gordon has processed seeing Leo and Rav, he tells them how Arkham Asylum has now been taken over and converted into the Grand Fortress of the Foot Clan, with the Penguin having become a double agent to work against them. Leonardo doesn't buy this, to which the Penguin responds by revealing that the Shredder and the Foot Clan is partnered up with Raj Al Ghul and the League of Assassins. Batman fills Leonardo and Raphael vaguely on who Raj is on their way back to the Batcave, where Gacy is back on his feet and along with Donatello and Michelangelo gets introduced to Damian Wayne's version of Robin. Since Damian was 10 to 12 years old during the New 52, Gacy doesn't take him seriously and is so made an example of before Donnie and Mikey are forced to hold on against Robin until Batman and Raphael arrive with Leonardo having fallen victim to the ooze mutagen in his system becoming inert. Due to Leo's situation, Casey tells everyone he crossed over with a portable device that can be used to go back and forth only once in three weeks. Meaning that if they use it to go back home now, they will be leaving Gotham in Shredders and the Foot Clan's mercy for the next three weeks. Leonardo doesn't want to leave Shredder at large in this world, but Batman tells him he and Robin can deal with him, just like everyone they have fought before. Robin tells that Raj has called more assassins to Gotham, who are there in hours, meaning that Batman needs to move against him and Shredder before they arrive. Master Splinter points out that Raj Al Ghul having called reinforcement could be means to double-cross Shredder and the Foot Clan, meaning that Shredder's retaliation could lead to unknown lengths in casualties. Batman acknowledges Master Splinter's input, but is still willing to risk it by going after Raj and Shredder, after giving respectful farewells to the Turtles and telling Alfred to do what he needs to get them home. Batman and Robin fly to Arkham with the Batplane and come across the Penguin in the issue's cliffhanger, where it is revealed that those five canisters of the ooze mutagen were used to turn Arkham inmates into animal mutants similar to Bebop and Rocksteady. Issue number 6. The final issue of the story opens with Batman and Robin fighting not to be overpowered by Elephant Bane, Hyena Harley Quinn, Praying Mantis Poison Ivy, Polar Bear Mr. Freeze, and so many others, while Alfred, the Turtles, Master Splinter and Casey Jones can only watch while waiting for the portable transport to charge up and the ooze in Leonardo's body becoming inert. Raphael, however, refuses to leave Batman and Robin alone to face everyone in Arkham after everything Batman has done to help them, and then the portable transporter activates, ready to send them home. In Arkham, Batman is overpowered and he sends Robin to secure the facility's premises before calling Raj to show himself. Raj appears to his son-in-law along with Shredder, and reveals that the arriving League of Assassins is on its way to combine with the Foot Clan as an unstoppable army, ready to take over every city around the globe one by one. They both also find Batman's misplaced assumption that they would betray one another as disappointment, and Shredder deems Batman unfit to be slain by him. So naturally, that honor is delegated to the Snake Joker, who also shares his plans to blend the ooze mutagen with his toxins. But before Batman can be given the fatal snake bite, Raphael appears to save him from the Snake Joker's bite and kicks Shredder, who was just told that the GCPD has surrounded the asylum. Master Splinter and the rest of the Turtles then appear to cover the Batman as they chose to stay behind to help him. Donatello frees Batman from Mr. Freeze's eyes and Poison Ivy's vines and tells him that he also brought with them something he found from the Batcave, while Master Splinter, Michelangelo and Raphael take on the mutated inmates. This something is revealed to be a turtle-shaped body armor, giving Batman more protection and strength to fight against Redder while the turtles go up against Raj as the inmates' number goes down. 
Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello and Raphael overpower Raj in a 4 on 1 fight, while Batman's fight against Shredder is shown on this one page of 20 panels and an image, until Shredder is worn down, and Master Splinter delivers the finishing blow after having run out of the mutated inmates. With Shredder, the inmates and Foot Clan ninjas down, Raj is forced to retreat when Robin shows up to tell his grandfather he took out all the arriving League of Assassin's ninjas somehow off-screen, and let the GCPD take them in. As the situation is now cleared, and another portal opens with Casey Jones and April O'Neil, who reveal that after Casey returned alone without the Turtles, they were able to lock onto this universe's frequency, and so open another portal for 20 minute stops. AKA, enough time for the Turtle to throw Shredder and the Foot Clan ninjas through the portal, and say goodbye to Batman and Robin. Before they leave, Raphael gives his mask to Batman as a token of friendship and as a gesture of Raph seeing Batman as a part of their family if they were ever to meet again. The story ends in the Batcave, with Batman, Robin and Alfred being called by Commissioner Gordon that the mutated Arkham inmates should be back to their former selves within a week. Now be the anniversary of Batman's parents' deaths, Bruce decides to spend it with his son Damien, after having witnessed the familial bond the Turtles had with each other and Master Splinter. I was planning to cover the second six issue miniseries like this as well, but that wouldn't make this video too long, so I'll just go over the highlights and necessities in it that tied to inspiring the 2019 animated movie. Before that, however, I need to quickly summarize a review part of this first one by saying that James Tinney and the Fourth managed to balance the mature seriousness of both franchises while acknowledging the younger demographic where the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are. Batman is obviously not a teenager, but rather a grown man in his, I assume, mid to late 30s in this story, but the bridge in helping him to connect with the Turtles was clearly Master Splinter, who in his elderly wisdom managed to see his sons and Batman on the same level. The story concept being a literal crossover with the Turtles, Master Splinter, Shredder and the Foot Clan being transported from their world to Batman's world is also not something new, but considering how it was used to add stakes and consequences to the story, it was noticeably more creative than just having the Turtles drive from New York to Gotham. This also provided both parties with a believable excuse of how neither of them had ever heard any, even obscure references of each other before meeting for the first time. The art by Freddie Williams II was also capable of blending both franchises' tones and keeping them balanced enough without going too far into being too serious or silly, while the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles co-creator Kevin Eastman also drew a bunch of variant covers. Being out of canon, the story was also given some leeway in having both Batman and the Turtles have some emotional growth that would have automatically been ignored going forward in the other stories set after this one by different writers. Moving on to these other stories, the sequel was in contrast mostly set in the Turtles home universe, and the story's conflict was kicked off after Donatello in wanting to go speak with Batman about his recent failures, ended up switching places with Dane, whom Batman was confronting. Ending up in the Turtles world, Dane took advantage of happening turf wars between the divided Foot Clan following Shredder's incarcerations, Purple Dragons and everyone else. Dane took over the New York criminal underworld while also securing his power by having Baxter Stockman recreate Venom for him, and in combining it with the Ooze mutagen to turn the Foot Clan ninjas along with Bebop and Rocksteady, bigger and stronger. And the version of Baxter Stockman in the Out of Canon story ended up turning into Jeff Goldblum. Batman and Robin eventually crossed over with Donatello, and after their first defeat in confronting Dane and his forces led to Master Splinter getting severely wounded, Robin and Raphael crossed back to Batman's world to heal him with a Lazarus pit, before coming back with Nightwing and Batgirl. The sequel then ended with Batman's family, the Turtles' family, and a broken out of prison Shredder confronting Dane and taking the power he took over away from him. The third sequel then had the fanfiction elements cracked up to 11 in including multiple multiversal versions of both Batman and the Turtles, and that is all I'm going to say about it. 
And then there was the fourth series, which was not canon to the first three, but was instead a separate story based on Batman the Animated Series crossing over with the 2012 TMNT cartoon, where the Mad Hatter discovered interdimensional portals between the two worlds, or rabbit holes to Wonderland from his perspective, and which could have worked better as an animated outing. But instead, we ended off with the 2019 Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, which dumped down the balanced nuance of these crossover stories, and leaned on to believing their audience would be too stupid to follow their concepts. Cowabunga! Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was directed by Jake Castorena and written by Marley Halpern Grazer a storyboard artist and a writer of some cartoons made for toddlers. I want to believe they are probably nice people in real life, and maybe they have moved on to better things by now. But looking at this move in comparison to the comic, it looks like the project was dumped onto them as a quick cash grab. Despite being rated PG-13, the way how this movie was written would make me believe it was rated PG. Gone is the Turtles and Batman being from separate universes, so there is no danger for the Turtles to become base animals in the absence of the ooze mutagen. Many characters, such as Lucius Fox, Daisy Jones, April O'Neil, and Master Splinter are not in this movie, and especially Master Splinter's absence keeps Batman and the Turtles from being seen on an equal crowd. Shredder and the Foot Clan are automatically already working with Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins from before the movie begins, and that draws out what they were planning throughout the entire movie, as if it needed to be explained to children who don't understand it. And all it amounts into is using the ooze mutagen to turn the people of Gotham into mutated human-animal hybrids because this movie was made as a cartoon aimed for children. Outside of this one bit where Shredder kills one of his ninjas. I think this movie starts out in trying to replicate what the comic was, in having the Foot Clan attack Powers Industrial and the Turtles fighting them is seen through Barbara Gordon's eyes, who then reports what she saw to Batman later as Batgirl. Then Batman fights the Foot Clan and later Shredder when they break into Wayne Enterprises, while the Turtles fight the Penguin and his men. And then when we come to the scene where the Turtles come across the Batmobile and are impressed by it before Batman shows up to fight them, I have to ask again, why is Batman's costume designed after the 1970s Neil Adam design with a bright blue cape and cowl, when his entrance silhouette makes him look more threatening? And this is also the only actual fight they have in the movie named Batman vs Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which only happens because of a misunderstanding, so why not name the movie Batman and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or Batman slash Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles instead? And then the Turtles retreat without Master Splinter, and do research that leads them into finding the Batcave in an insultingly easy way that makes no sense without having Master Splinter gone to Shadow Batman to Wayne Enterprise and see him as Bruce Wayne. At the Batcave, they are introduced to Robin, and eventually reintroduce themselves to Batman and Batgirl, after Robin lets them know that Shredder and the Foot Clan are working with Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins. And their evil plan is to combine the ooze mutagen with the Joker's Joker Venom to make those infected with it become mindless beasts. That leads to an action set piece in Arkham Asylum, where they get the formula for the Joker Venom from the Joker, and in exchange give him a canister of the ooze mutagen, to turn the other Arkham inmates into human-animal hybrids for Batman, Robin, Batgirl and the Turtles to fight when they follow their tracks there. Batman is also infected with the ooze slash Joker Venom mix, and turns into a rampaging werebat mutant, whom while Robin, Batgirl and the Turtles need to cure along with the Arkham inmates, Ross and Shredder buy a Cloud Seeder that Penguin acquired from Wayne Enterprises, 
meaning that the Arkham incident was a distraction. And the final third act climax is at the Ace Chemicals where Raj and Shredder have Baxter Stockman, who is already Jeff Goldblum, perfecting the U slash Joker Venom mix. Batman fights Shredder with Raphael, Leonardo fights Raj, and Donatello and Michelangelo sabotage the Cloud Seeder from spreading the U slash Joker Venom, and in the end it crashes back onto Ace Chemicals and drops Shredder into a vat of Joker Venom. Having won, the Turtles prepare to leave, but Batman, despite not having had a similar bonding character development with them as in the comic, decides to have a pizza time with them before they leave. And in the post credit scene, Shredder, who fell into a vat of Joker Venom, is shown to have turned into a Joker ripoff. But even three years after this movie came out, there has been no announcements for a sequel to carry over from this. I don't want to be harsher on this movie than I need to be, but as an adaptation compared to James Tini and the Forge written stories, this movie feels like a studio mandated downgrade aimed at a much younger demographic. Which on its own would be fine, but since the source material pre exists the adaptation, just like with Superman and Batman Public Enemies, the comic ends up being automatically the better story with more rereading value. James Tinney and the Fourth was able to balance the crossovers he wrote so that both Batman and the Turtles were seen on equal grounds through the eyes of Master Splinter, whose absence did not help with the movie's narrative. Not to mention how the movie was still set in Gotham where the Turtles just ended up visiting like they got an anonymous invite to come to. That makes this more of a Batman movie with the Turtles as visiting guest stars, and the pacing of making the movie come across like it all took place over one night after Batman and the Turtles teamed up. That just makes the movie come across as rushed, whereas the comic gave incentive that days or a week of time was skipped between issues 3 and 4. Again, on its own, this movie could have been fine, but if you are a fan of either Batman, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or both, you more than likely got your hands into the comics and read them before this movie was announced. If you didn't, then that is a point of view I cannot speak for, but I expect those people to be smart enough to realize how childishly the movie's dialogue was written, as if to hold the viewer's hand so they understood it. I've read rumors about a supernatural bat creature in Gotham, but I assumed it was an urban legend or that he was a mutant like us. Love being an amphibian as much as the next guy. Amphibious, we're still reptiles. Yeah, and I just see the signs of a dude with way too much time and way too much money on his hands. My name is Leonardo. These are my brothers. Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo. Seriously? Our father was really into Renaissance painters. And he's a rat! Batman? Father! I gave you a chance, but you four are impulsive and you don't follow orders. I want you out of Gotham. And then there were some questionable design choices where I need to ask for the third time. Why was Batman given the 1970s Neil Adams designed bat suit that looks worse than in the Batman the Animated Series and the 2004's The Batman cartoon, when both Robin and Batgirl were given their modern costumes? So basically, this animated adaptation is a low-hanging fruit that will impress people who didn't read the comics it was based on and have very low standards. It is fine as a crossover between Batman and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but when I know the comic crossover series exists, I cannot look at this animated adaptation without thinking this could have been so much better. I should probably say something about the voice cast as well, they were mostly fine too, but held back by the simplified dialogue written for them. Troy Baker, for example, who voiced the Joker in Arkham Origins and Batman in the Telltale games, was now for the first time hired to voice them both. I have a feeling this is just one part of the puzzle. 
but I've got it right here. But despite as well as he could balance performing them both, mentioning that feels like a boring footnote on this mediocre kids film made to cash in from the more superior comic series. And I think the nicest way to say that the comic was better would be by saying that without Master Splinter this movie ended up lacking discipline. If you disagree with my comparison, you can like or dislike this video and comment your counter arguments down in the comment section. If you agree with me, share the video and subscribe for other videos I will have coming in the future. Also, if you want to chat with me, then ding the bell to be alerted when I have chosen a game to stream myself playing next. And may your heart be your guiding key.